Uh, okay, so our next speaker is uh, Professor Martin Bazant. Uh, Martin uh, is the E.G. Roos uh, Professor of Chemical Engineering and Mathematics at MIT. He joined the Mathematics Department in 2000, uh, and then he moved his Center of Mass to Chemical Engineering in 2008, uh, I think it's fair to say, and then uh, where he served as executive officer of that department from 2016 to 2020. Among many awards, uh, he's been awarded, for example, the Andreas Akrabos Award for Professional Progress in Chemical Engineering, um, as well as the MIT X Prize for Teaching and Learning in, in MOOCs. Um, he also serves as Chief Scientific Advisor for San Goban uh, Research in North America. And he's going to be talking uh, today about uh, flow transport analyses um, in order to gauge the risk of transmission of COVID in indoor spaces. So, uh, and I should also mention Martin is a, a member of our advisory board. So thank you, Martin. Great, well, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Juan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, a part of the launch to the journal uh, through the advisory board uh, and to see already the, the great papers that have been published, which you'll see also in the talks today. Um, and also, I appreciate the invitation to present uh, my work, which is also a paper that was published uh, just this week in the first issue of Flow, uh, which has to do with uh, monitoring carbon dioxide to quantify the transmission of COVID-19 in indoor spaces. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors for this paper are listed here, which include Usman Kodio and Professor John Bush uh, in the math department at MIT. Uh, uh, my student Alex Cohen and uh, lecturer in our department in chemical engineering Joey Gu, and also Qasim Khan, who is an unaffiliated uh, app developer who helped us um, with the applications of the fluid mechanics to this important problem. So I want to start with what I consider to be a very important slide. It's slightly tongue in cheek, but at the same time, very serious, which is that I have to warn you that what I'm about to tell you is medical misinformation. And this is as defined by many of those uh, uh, entities that control speech and content uh, on the internet or even more broadly. So in particular, here's YouTube's policy, a direct quote on medical misinformation, which essentially states that it's defined as anything having to do with the topic that contradicts local health authorities. So, you know, my parents escaped communism uh, and uh, we have a healthy uh, fear of uh, local health, local authorities in general. So that kind of makes me bristle a little bit. And then I kind of am a bit amused by the note, which is that, by the way, the local authorities may change their minds, actually. So therefore, truth is kind of a fluid thing that is actually controlled by local authorities. So my statement is at the bottom, science and in fact, democracy depend on skepticism of local authorities and open debate of, quote, misinformation. And actually, censorship, in my opinion, is illiberal and counterproductive. It's definitely counterproductive, as that's what we're going to see now. So, um, you know, here in this, I've been giving talks on this for, uh, since I've been working about a year and a half on this topic, uh, since the, since kind of the spring of 2020. Um, so I'm kind of, I prepared <laughs> some headlines here to summarize what actually by that definition consists of scientists spreading medical misinformation, myself included. So some early voices that were extremely important included uh, William Rist uh, Bill Ristenpart, uh, who is a professor of chemical engineering, uh, who uh, may have been the very first actually to uh, publish a paper speculating that actually COVID-19 may be spread primarily by exhaled aerosol particles rather than by the uh, meth mode of uh, fomites on surfaces for which we're deep cleaning or for coughs and sneezes and large droplets that are emitted. Uh, which was uh, quite contradictory to public health guidance at, at that time. Um, a, a real leader in that field uh, who published an even more blunt uh, assessment was Lydia Morowska, who essentially said that the world should face reality that COVID-19 is spread by indoor airborne aerosols. And she started laying out the evidence, and she's been studying that problem in other diseases for, for many years. Um, in fact, organized by Morowska and other scientists, uh, there was an open letter uh, published and covered here by the New York Times uh, in the summer arguing that the coronavirus is airborne. At that time, the World Health Organization and CDC had not yet acknowledged that, uh, uh, said it's inconclusive. Um, well, uh, for I was, I have to say, one important reason to allow these kinds of voices to be heard is that it inspires others. And when you silence voices, you chill uh, people's 
feeling that they can go in new directions and think openly. So I was convinced early on, in fact, when I read uh, Bill Rissenpart's paper that, that, uh, uh, that in fact the transmission may be airborne. And I studied some of the uh, early super spreading events and, and, and began to analyze them and thought about creating a model of airborne transmission and, 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 not that that, and that's something that's been done before for sure, but to actually try to formulate a model that captures the key physics, but leads to a safety guideline that can tell you sort of how, how can you, you know, at, at that time we were facing shutdowns uh, of, of, of spaces, reducing occupancy, et cetera. And so I wanted to provide a guideline for when you should do that and when you can let people come back, when you can take the masks off, when you can bring them back. So I started working with my colleague, John Bush, and uh, uh, over the summer, uh, ended up formulating a theory and submitting a paper, uh, to, uh, a posting on MedArchive, um, which had the uh, uh, title Beyond Six Feet. Um, I'll tell you when this paper was eventually published, we were asked to remove that. I actually really like that title uh, because it has many meanings, including the fact that transmission can go farther than six feet. So you should be aware of that. So when you see these little six foot stickers on the ground, uh, don't think that uh, you're 100% safe, but also that the six foot rule, which is being pushed at least here in the United States is the best way to keep us safe, may not be the most important measure uh, to actually keep us safe. Uh, so uh, we forged ahead, and in fact, I was very fortunate, in fact, to get connected uh, through one of my students with uh, Kasim, uh, who was, a, was an app developer, who took our guideline and turned it into an online app, which has since been, uh, since last September, uh, been translated into 15 languages with all of our uh, uh, sort of team of uh, friends and collaborators across the globe. Uh, we've had around a, around a million uh, uses of it in the last year. Uh, it was peaking uh, over the winter, but there's, it still continues to, to be used. And in fact, I encourage you to play with it if you're interested. I also spent a lot of my time in last year with media, both print and, and, and TV and et cetera, to try to get the word out uh, because still public health guidance was not really keeping up. I went really far in that, uh, as, uh, as Juan had mentioned, um, I have been uh, really focusing in, in the last uh, five years on creating massive online courses uh, uh, at the time through edX. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe the best way to get this information out is not to wait for six months for, you know, paper to be published that only scientists can read, but to actually explain the physics in simple terms and make it as accessible as possible. And so I created a massive online course uh, with Joey uh, Gu, who's a lecturer in our department, um, which we uh, ended up put together very quickly and released it um, in, uh, last December. We've had about 5,000 enroll enrolled and, and a number of people actually getting certificates. We also posted the lectures only on YouTube uh, through MIT's Open Courseware channel. And thankfully I was not censored, but perhaps that's because we came from MIT. I have to wonder if I had the exact same thing to say and I didn't have the clout of uh, such a university behind me, uh, perhaps might've been a different uh, reception. So then what's interesting is as all this was going on, as I was doing all this advocacy and so were uh, Lydia Morowska and Jose Jimenez and other, uh, Lindsay Marr, other major figures in the field, um, the uh, public health authorities did start to feel the pressure to address the science that was emerging. And so uh, interestingly, as you may recall, actually last November, the CDC posted some guidelines suggesting that the coronavirus could be airborne and then they took it down and then a week later, it came back. So there's obviously, I don't know the reason for that, but there was obviously some dissent. And when it did come back, it was essentially an acknowledgement that it could potentially transmit through the air, but that's probably not the most important mode. So my paper with John went through a very rigorous review process at PNAS and was finally published in April. Um, notice the Beyond Six Feet uh, title is gone. Um, and it did generate a lot of attention. Uh, so, uh, you know, covered in the news and, and, and in fact, uh, lots of other, uh, uh, I guess, forms of impact you could say. So the word really did start to get out very quickly at that point about airborne transmission and also how you might protect against it. And one, one example of uh, uh, the coverage is that you know, social distancing may provide a false sense of security, uh, which was in April, shortly after the publication. And then finally, um, uh, I would say that we arrived at new public health guidance through a process by which what would be defined as medical misinformation was debated uh, openly, uh, you know, in some channels, you know, for, for about a year and a half, actually. So it was in uh, May that the CDC finally acknowledged that airborne transmission may actually be the dominant mode of transmission. And today we essentially take for granted that we should be wearing masks. We're not as concerned with exactly where we're standing. Uh, you know, we are more willing to take the masks off outdoors, although there are still some risks. 
but at least uh, it's nice to see that the that thinking has has changed. So let's talk about the guideline now. Um, or sorry, before I get to that. So how actually is the coronavirus transmitted? So um, there's a lot of uh, epidemiological evidence by studying spreading events. You can see, you know, for example, you can rule out transmission through touching surfaces or through coughs and sneezes, um, and, and in fact, can 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 find uh, indirect evidence of airborne transmission. There's also direct evidence of the formation of infectious droplets and actually collecting those droplets from the air and showing that they do contain infectious virus. Um, and just briefly, uh, let me. Uh, describes some of the, the pining work of Elidia Morovska, which also was, uh, um, in fact, uh, uh, sort of reproduced and extended by Bill Ristenpart to study the droplet emissions from the respiratory tract, which depend actually quite sensitively on the respiratory activity, as I'll show in just a moment. But roughly speaking, the peak of the droplet distribution that's emitted is at the scale of around a micron, as these are quite small droplets, obviously would remain suspended for very long or potentially very long periods of time. And those are believed to come from the fragmentation of airway mucus in the smallest uh, channels of the uh, basically termination of the airway uh, channels uh, in the lungs um, uh, with, through the so-called bronchial film burst mode, as basically those channels are, are opening and collapsing and, and air is rushing past and fragmenting uh, that fluid. Um, but also uh, there is a very significant part, which it only recently have we realized how important it is um, from the larynx, in fact. And in fact, the very act of speaking or singing actually dramatically increases the amount of uh, emission of droplets. And here's a movie that helps you understand why. Uh, so here is somebody actually just speaking and it's been slowed down here. So you can see the sound is made by the vocal folds flapping back and forth. They're covered with, uh, with airway mucus. And you can see that you can actually see films being pushed apart and fragmented. And this is in a healthy person where there's, you know, a relatively small amount of the mucus not containing um, infectious uh, uh, virus, for example. And then finally, there also are much larger drops that, that are at the scale of tens or even hundreds of microns that come from larger regions where fluid is fragmented. And this comes from the work of Howard Stone, where you see uh, emission of droplets when somebody is opening their mouth and you might think that person is spitting, that person is simply speaking. And in fact, certain so-called plosive consonants do lead to these kinds of emissions because your lips come together and pull apart and there's some liquid there, uh, some, some saliva, and it is fragmented and ejected into the air. So these aerosols do uh, carry the risk of um, a, a spreading disease. So uh, to make a long story short, so in our, in our PNAS paper, uh, we analyzed a number of spreading events and also took into account uh, the distributions of droplets emitted in different forms of uh, respiration, ranging from different types of breathing to speaking to singing, and ended up making this kind of chart for the original uh, strain, the Wuhan strain of SARS-CoV-2 uh, for sort of how infectious the air is that is being exhaled. And there's some consistency to the estimates across different spreading events and also different droplet distribution uh, measurements. We've also uh, rescaled these numbers appropriately for new variants, such as the Delta variant, which is estimated to be perhaps 2.5 times as uh, transmissible as the original uh, strain. And in fact, this can be applied to any respiratory disease. In fact, seasonal flu, measles, and others, which are also believed to be spread by the airborne route. Um, so here is the guideline uh, which uh, prescribes a limit on what I call the cumulative exposure time. So it's the number of susceptible people in the room, and uh, which could be the full occupancy N minus one infected person. If we perceive, you know, if we look at the situation where if an infected person comes in, we want to limit the transmission from that person. And it times the time, which is tau here. And so number times time is bounded by the expression on the right. So if you plot occupancy versus time for any given room, that's a hyperbola, this blue curve. And one side is safe, the other side is unsafe. And of course, exactly where you draw that, that, that boundary involves a risk tolerance, that's the epsilon. But the important thing is, what does that bound depend on? So you make the space more safe or you increase the bound by having a larger room, a faster air change rate, uh, ventilation, uh, filtration is uh, introduced, uh, especially at a higher rate of airflow. Uh, and then there's natural deactivation of the virus, which can also be enhanced by humidity or uh, ultraviolet radiation and things like that. And you make the space uh, less safe uh, by 
taking off masks, for example, or not having the, that direct filtration occurring, uh, uh, the, there is the effect of breathing. So faster breathing rate means faster introduction and sampling of the air. The air infectiousness uh, CQ that I introduced on the last slide is very sensitive to respiratory activity. In fact, that last slide shows it can vary by uh, uh, up to three orders of magnitude between essentially rest breathing through the nose and loud singing. And finally, there are variations also having to do with the strain of the virus and also very importantly for, for COVID-19, the age uh, and relative health of the occupants. So what I want to get to today, though, uh, is the, the new paper in Flow uh, builds on some really brilliant work uh, from the two papers listed here on the notion of using carbon dioxide as a proxy uh, to, uh, to, to estimate in real time the risk of transmission of a respiratory infection. So this concept was introduced by Rudnick and Milton in 2003. And uh, just before us, actually, uh, Peng and Jose Jimenez, I mentioned earlier, have a nice paper adapting that model uh, to COVID-19. And then our paper in Flow, uh, I would say, uh, takes the theory a bit further and accounts for uh, the sort of transient real-time nature of the measurement, as well as effects such as filtration um, and, and mass uh, and, and, and also the, 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 the prevalence of infection and vaccination. So the way this works is that it's an old concept, actually, in, in building science and engineering that uh, any passive tracer, including CO2, it can be a proxy for uh, the sort of generation of that gas balanced against the removal of that gas in an indoor space, assuming the space is well mixed, which is actually often a reasonably good assumption in uh, indoor spaces. And so in particular, there, you can easily estimate if you're producing CO2 at a certain rate by breathing, uh, which by the way is exhaled at about uh, 38,000 or 40,000 ppm uh, parts per million, uh, relative to the removal of that uh, of that CO2, which is only by ventilation or introduction of fresh air. And so that's the expression here at the top. Um, by the way, for reference, um, the background uh, concentration of CO2 uh, on the earth ranges from the high 300s to the mid 400s. In urban areas, it's higher. Uh, also, carbon emissions have slowly been increasing that number. Uh, we find around MIT, it's about 410. Uh, and Poor air quality is considered to be around maybe 1,000 ppm. If you're exposed for several hours to 2,000 ppm, you start to get a headache potentially. And 5,000 ppm for more than um, you know, even an hour can start to uh, have some health risks. Um, and in fact, it's well established that CO2 itself is a proxy uh, uh, for, for uh, estimating other types of problems in a space, uh, such as uh, you know, just la lack of oxygen, other kinds of... Uh, uh, perhaps infection and it's so just CO2 has been correlated in the public health field with absenteeism from work, even low test scores by children. So, so CO2 is an interesting measure of many health effects. But what we wanna focus on is transmission of respiratory disease. And if you take the simple formula at the top and you substitute it into the, the guideline I just showed you, you get this very simple formula here, which expresses the safety guideline now as a bound on the CO2. So what is the CO2 level that's safe? And this number, the, the, the bound is actually relatively constant because now you've eliminated this uncertainty about production of CO2 and how much ventilation is in the space because those already reach an equilibrium. So it kind of cancels some of the terms, um, but time still enters. So there the tau is in the denominator is still time because the, you know, the more time you spend in the space, the more you're potentially exposed. Um, so just to drive that point home, also here we have a plot of the safe CO2 level versus time, and it's on a logarithmic axis. So you can see, uh, you know, let's say you pick a number like a thousand is a limit you don't want to uh, perhaps, uh, well, well, that's where you know we have trouble anyway. But when we cross these colored lines, we, you know, switch from, let's say, safe to unsafe, according to the guideline. And I just want to point out that there's quite a bit of variation here. So, uh, First of all, if you have any kind of filtration of droplets, either due to masks or to say MERV filters in the air ducts, this thing moves because the CO2 is not affected, but the droplets are removed. And so you have to account for that. And the second thing, which is very important as we move now from COVID-19 being pandemic to potentially endemic and sort of being still with us in some form, um, we have to recognize that as the, as the immunity of the population goes up and the uh, number of um, the prevalence of infection goes down, that the chance that there really is an infected susceptible pair in the room also is going down. And that actually allows you to sort of move this curve even further to the right and start to, uh, you know, maybe a more realistic estimates of the 
uh, safe time and CO2 level in a room. So this is just a very simple formula that actually can be easily uh, implemented. We've also done in this paper a more uh, careful uh, time dependent analysis that if you are given the actual time series of CO2, you can convert that uh, by doing some time integrals over the memory of the system into an actual expected number of transmissions in that space, which you'd like to keep you know, far below uh, one. So we've done some CO2 measurements, actually the Usman has done that um, at MIT. Um, and, and by the way, you can buy a CO2 monitor for a few hundred dollars. Um, so there's this something, you know, I encourage you to even try uh, yourself. So you can see, for example, in a small office on the left, one person in the office bumps it up from 400 to 600. Second person comes in, it gets closer to 800 uh, for a period of time. And then when those people leave, then the CO2 relaxes uh, back down. Um, and what we see on the bottom is how the how this formula translates the instantaneous uh, CO2 uh, or the CO2 time series into a, uh, a level of risk expressed here as an indoor reproductive number. So if one of the people in the room were in infected, uh, what would be the expected number of transmissions, uh, which is also a bound on the uh, probability that there's no transmissions um, occurring. Um, so, uh, so, so basically if the guideline is say 10%, you might cross that after an hour if nobody's wearing masks, but if you have filtration or you're wearing masks, it starts to come down and you can see how much safer it might be. We've also done it in classrooms and determined that our classrooms are typically at MIT anyway, extremely safe because they're large, well-ventilated spaces. And also at that time, even occupancy was being limited. And so, you know, by this calculation, even with no masks actually, uh, uh, you know, it's a very low transmission rate expected. And by the way, the data is not so much publicized at, at MIT and in fact, many of the other universities too, the actual number of transmissions that are believed to have occurred on campus um, in classrooms is extremely low. In fact, that's even quite true of schools in the United States that have been studied. The transmissions are usually off campus where people are in small spaces at home without masks, spending long periods of time. Uh, that's where the transmissions more likely occur than in a larger, uh, well-ventilated uh, uh, space. So I'd like to close with a little more fluid mechanics. Um, I have to apologize that I haven't really shown you that much fluid mechanics, and I appreciate that Juan was still willing to uh, accept this paper uh, in the journal Flow. Um, so that was basically what you just saw was simple you know, mass balances. But uh, as this picture of smoking shows, and this is from a nice website of uh, Jose Jimenez and collaborators, um, you can think of really two types of transmission. There's the long range transmission we've been talking about, which is kind of like secondhand smoke. That's just in a well mixed room. If you're there for long periods of time, you're exposed to the background of the particles essentially that don't sediment. And there social distancing is not very important um, and time and occupancy become much more important. Um, on the other hand, as you know, if someone is smoking and breathes directly in your face, there are these turbulent plumes actually that have obviously an elevated risk. It's for a short period of time, but it's a much higher concentration and their social distancing would play a role and mass also can block that. So I just wanna mention here, there's been some nice work on studying these flows from the work of Paul Linden um, at, uh, at Cambridge and also uh, some really nice work uh, visualizing flows and analyzing the turbulent plumes, which by the way, look a lot like the plumes that uh, Andy Woods just showed us in the ocean, but at a very different scale uh, from the work of Howard Stone. Um, and using the theory of turbulent plumes, uh, you can actually uh, derive a modified safety guideline, which uh, John and I did in our paper, where you have the guideline I just showed you, plus a correction that if you're not wearing masks and you have these turbulent plumes, then if X is the typical distance, let's say either an enforced distance or a typical distance that people have uh, in a given space, um, and P jet is the probability that you're actually in one of those jets, given say the angle, how often do people face each other, uh, then you can, you can estimate uh, you know, sort of how much additional risk there is. And, and it can in some cases be significant. And if you go outside, then the whole like secondhand smoke and indoor transmission goes away because the warm air, you know, tends to rise from the breathing and especially, um, you know, in an outdoor setting, it, it's, it's uh, more easily fl uh, flushed away, but you still have this short range transmission risk, even outdoors. So it's something still to uh, keep in mind. So the last, uh, last thing I'll just show you here is that um, if you put all this together, you can actually des design a rational policy for when you shut down occupancy and also when you remove masks as a or even impose social distancing as a function of the prevalence and uh, immunity in a population. And so I won't go into you know, too many details here, but I just think this is really something that's needed now because the entire time the uh, pronouncements from 
uh, governments or public health officials have not been justified by any kind of calculations. Like we think you should have only 50% occupancy in this restaurant or you know, that kind of thing. And, and we, it really can be much more quantitative. And especially as COVID continues to be with us, we need to have more quantitative measures of when we take uh, certain actions and also when we take those actions away. If we don't have a theory, we don't know when should we take the masks off? When should we let us go back to full occupancy? Um, and so, so that that's I think we have a theory that can that can uh, can can guide us in that. So with that, I'll just, I'll just finish and 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 just uh, note also my website here. You can find the app, and it does include CO two concentration, and that's something we did associated with this paper and flow. Thank you.